So this video is on object-oriented programming and it's the four main principles. I'm actually going to zoom in here so we can see all of this. This is um, something that I've written. So it's the um, four main principles of object-oriented programming. And the reason why I, I've done, I've written like a, you know, a few, a bunch of things, um, but I actually modified um, this particular one this morning. And the reason why is because I believe that I had it wrong. And um, some of the things that I've tended to do in the past, at least while I was constructing all of um, the knowledge I had, was to kind of like, and we do rely on the web and other things, and, and kind of like, um, you know, we sort of like copy and paste a lot of the stuff that we do, and uh, tend to sometimes um, just take it as given rather than challenging it ourselves. So I've kind of like modified this a little bit because the four main principles of objects are into programming, and they're known as this. And I actually question even why, and this is more from a science perspective, um, why there can't be like five or six principles, or like you know why you can. Um, encompassed to like at least two of these principles into one but um whatever kind of like let's get the breakdown of what it actually means anyway and for example like why couldn't you have five principles but um and leave a comment um it, it, you know in the video itself if you think that there are other principles um you know that there should be like a fifth or sixth principle and so forth and that that um that is applicable but this is what the four main principles are. The first one is encapsulation, and I've put it into very, very simple, like English text, as it was, rather than using these, um, the, the, these bigger words. And I, and I felt it needed to be done because the text I copied from other places was a little bit complicated, and actually, to the extent that I believe it was wrong. So. You know, we know what encapsulation means, like the, the English definition of it, at least, which is at least. And, and these top three, uh, encapsulation, abstraction and inheritance, we, we kind of like know what these are. OK, maybe some people won't like be familiar with polymorphism, but the top three, we're, we're kind of like we should be familiar, at least on an English language basis of what encapsulation means. To encapsulate something is to put something like enclose it in some little space in some way, right? So let's just call it keeping the code together in a single unit. And it's kind of like, like if you think of it like that, that gets you through encapsulation. What does it mean? We'll go through and have a little look. Um, and really, like at, at the bottom of all of this, I've kind of like broken these two, these four pillars down into two sets of two. So everything here um, applies to objects object oriented programming but it's really talking about classes okay now the encapsulation part of it and i might modify this just slightly because i see that i haven't put like full stops at the end of the sentence and stuff like that so i might um you know um just complete the, the last little pieces of this but um encapsulation really just refers to a class and um you know we'll see that when we get down and i will extract open what each one of these uh, one by one the next one is abstraction and it's a bit of a weird one um because abstraction in mathematics at least is kind of like um I'm trying to think it's not the same exactly when you abstract something in maths as the same as what we mean in um, coding, which is basically, or the coding version at least, is to hide the implementation details. Now, I'm going to call this closer to things that are um, public and private. Um, and that's kind of like what it is. So, like, we've got this now. We've we've now got this encapsulated object. So everything sort of like in one place in this single unit, and we could choose to expose some of these things out or retain some of these things inside. And that's uh, effectively what's referred to as abstraction, hiding the implementation details. Um, Something, uh, and again, we're going to see this, but but it's, it's something where um, like an intermediary function that's doing some hard work, but it's not something that needs to be seen by the outside world. So it's still necessary for the core running um, of something inside a class in some way, 
um, but the outer world doesn't need to see like the whole bunch of that code they just sort of like need want to see the nice clean result so uh, abstraction is a good way to achieve this so that that's at least my interpretation of uh, abstraction if you feel that you've got a better interpretation of abstraction leave a comment that's probably the best thing to do the next one is inheritance and again we know what inheritance is because we inherit things from our parents and so forth um, and it works in the same way for programming where, where um, you've built something and you don't want to rebuild it a second third and fourth time so if you can do and if you can inherit then that means that you can um, inherit some of the properties methods attributes whatever that might be from other pieces of the code you can reuse your code effectively so inheritance is quite a useful thing to have um, and kind of like even on like a human level like um, a child inherits from its parents so genetically it gets some of the things from its parents so um, it's kind of like a mini replication um, of its parent to a reasonably large degree and then it's got other things as so a child will do some things that are different from its parent um, but so they will share some features that's the inherited part and then other features won't be inherited in the new bits and finally like the last one is probably the word that maybe people don't know or come across as much because it is much less of an English word uh, but polymorphism um, are methods where, um, effectively with the same name but they're in different classes uh, and I put that in like this English ver wording version of it right what does it mean um, really, like because there's a more complicated version if you so like look up like what polymorphism is um, but basically, if you want to have um, meth uh, like functions uh, uh, effectively that have the same name but behave in a different way, and that's how it's kind of like described. Uh, but I'm just saying, literally, stick it into different classes because that's actually what's done. So you want these functions that behave in a different way um, that have the same name. Um, so they behave in um, yeah, they behave in different ways, but they've uh, got the same name. Well, you'd have um, naming clashes at least in Python because a lot of the the second one that was constructed would overwrite the first one. But if you put it in classes, you could um, identify them very easily. So we're going to now uh, and uh, described in this section. So click to expand. I've made this. I've kind of like tested the code at least so I know that it works and, and the, like the little examples basically. So here is the full thing of encapsulation. In Python encapsulation is the process of wrapping data and code together in a single unit, typically an object. Okay, we call we use classes um, everywhere, and it's not just in Python, it's all object oriented programming languages. You know, this object is the class. Encapsulation is a key concept in object-oriented programming, and it helps to ensure the uh, that it helps to ensure that the interval workings of an object are hidden from the outside world. And again, I might be changing this in a way. Oh no, no, that's perfectly fine actually. Um, so one of the things that we have here is. Um, this double underscore that will hide things from the outside well there are several ways to achieve to achieve encapsulation in python python attributes you can use a double underscore notation um, to define private attributes um, in python um, private attributes are not accessible from the outside object and they can only be accessed or modified using special methods uh, known as ancestors and mutators and basically here it is we so we define we create this um, class here we can initialize it we can call our um, class and um, something like here is like this private and we can create this private attribute that isn't seen by the outside world and um, also in a way I guess um, the encapsulation apart from this double underscore part is also referring to and we can think of it uh, uh, um, you know the encapsulation and the abstraction in um, certain ways which that they're effectively self-contained so we, we create this we have the we create we have this we make this object and we assign it to um, the, my class we give it um, we create this class um, this class doesn't have any any um, variables that go into it um, and then we can print our um, we, we can get our private object out of the class so we can do 
um, this type of thing. Everything is inside my class. We could, uh, we could, and probably a better version of encapsulation is all of the, we could have related functions that are inside the my class. So what I might do actually is, this, this is a code that I've kind of like constructed. You can sort of like see it working if I open up. I'll open up this bit, and this was the other one that I actually created just now. Um, so I won't do that one, let's just do this one here, which is percentage. I'll do it down here, and I will hit clear over here. I'll use the interactive Python because it's probably a bit cleaner to do it this way. And I will put the um, what we're calling our encapsulation up here. Let's just remove the line breaks. I don't even know why they're there. Oh, well, I don't even know why they're there. It's because of copy and paste. There we go. So our version of the code. And we'll do control return to run our little piece of the code. And I would also expand this. So let's just do that while it's doing all of its thinking. We're loading the kernel at the moment. So if I do control plus plus plus, um, it makes um, that a little bit bigger so it's visible. Just activating our Python now and my classrooms. And what, what we get out of this, so this piece of code here, um, this piece of code here, oops, I just that was a world worth circle that I was about to draw. So just delete that one. Um, this little piece of code here now runs in the interactive Python session here, and I'll run this second piece of code afterwards over here. So just let me delete that and go back. But what actually what, what we actually get is this private attribute. And the thing about this is is um, if I kind of like do like object over here, so obj. Um, and then dot what we get is um, this double underscore and the double underscore notation in Python is the thing that kind of like tells you because Python doesn't actually have um, public and private methods in the same way that other languages do so it has notation which is if you want something to be private you use the double underscore it's kind of like don't touch it's just private uh, there's no need for you to kind of like look into what this is um, and here are our two public um, are two public variables so um, it's kind of like got this nice clean way of doing it effectively so um, and everything's sort of like encapsulated nicely in here and we could like if this class wasn't just my class but something like my my math class so something like this so I would need to change this to uh, my uh, my math class if I was to do something like this I could then put in a whole bunch of and, and this really is the encapsulation part of it which is um, I could put in a whole bunch of functions like def add nums right and then a comma b we need to put a self in there self because it's inside of the um, inside of the class itself and then we could do something like return and then um, a comma b so oops, so not a comma b but a plus b and likewise we could do have another one def um, subtract numbers so something like this and it would be self again a comma b there's something else that's actually quite interesting which um, when i talk about this um which is callback functions which you can do something uh, even cuter uh, than that but basically this would uh, return a minus b and we can see here now that um, these are publicly exposed so these are things that we could we would be able, we will be able to see outside of the class and in fact we can do something like um, well in here we'd need to get a and b um, again we could make them private if we wanted to but we, we could now get like a and b over here we would ne then need to do we could keep, still keep the private attribute there, but then we'd have self dot a equals a, and um, well, actually, I don't even think we do. We need to get a and b in there. No, we don't need to actually. We could just use them as our uh, as is. So let's just do that. I'll, I'll keep that out of there for now. But I believe that we could just do, because they are inside of the function, we could do something like um, our result 
is oh at least we need well yeah we've got the my math class equals um object dot and then add nums so tap that add nums and that requires an a and a b so like um 10 and 20 and we could print the sum is and then result and presumably this will work and it does the sum is 30 so it's all this um add numbers now belongs into my math class and it's probably a good place to put it if we wanted to do addition in that way and also we could um, have the same thing which is we'll take exactly the same thing nearly apart from that we are not going to do add we're going to do subtract numbers yeah, there we go and the diff is and then result and it should give us there we get we get minus 10 because we put uh, a, a 10 and a 20 so it would be 10 minus 20 so there we go um so so that's that first part of it which is uh, encapsulation the next piece is abstraction what is abstraction and again kind of like abstraction is is, uh, is a programming technique that's used to hide the implementation details of a class uh, or function and to expose only the essential features to the user and kind of like in a way we've sort of like already utilized it in the encapsulation process and i still want to self identify the difference between the two but here i've got something i, I do a similar thing i believe which is and i hope I've, i i think i've copied and pasted the whole thing in from previously but so here is an example of how you would use abstraction in python and here um, again we've defined pi as like 3.14159 whatever it is going on and we could actually have our full version of pi because you know like it's way way longer it's uh, you know it goes on infinitely um, but we could have another version of pi which is pi for engineers which is just three it's good enough as an approximation for many many things that we want to do um, anyway, we do our, our same thing. So we um, initialize our class and then here we um, calculate this area. This area is a public function, right? Um, but we might want to have like some other body of code. And imagine that this was a lot longer, right? Um, you know, that it did many, many other things, um, but we don't kind of want to show it all to the user because it's not necessary to have this big kind of like um, piece of code that's necessarily visible because they don't care about it. Um, all we want to do is be able to call this method. Um, so this method, I've just called it like the hidden method, basically. And I've used this double underscore notation again for the hidden method. And, and then the um, person or the outside user who's using this they just can call this engineering method that calls this hidden method so um, what we've done is really abstracted or like whatever was in this block of code now this is tiny so the abstraction doesn't really work to, to the same extent like, what's the point of it because um, you've written one piece of code that's just two lines long and you've uh, fed it in to uh, another piece of code um, down here that calls the same thing line above line so it didn't doesn't look like it has much purpose but imagine that this was like you know um, I don't know uh, 500 lines of code long um, you know you might want to put it somewhere at the bottom of your method and then kind of like call it uh, you know like uh, at the bottom of your class somewhere so, so like the crunching parts of the code and then the um, exposed part like the resulting bits like the clean bits you might want to put at the top the bits that the that the user will use outside of the class so um, it, it's basically that sort of formalism and again i've got that because I, I really i think i had it from here we go we've got the mic so here is that circle one that i copied i actually copied and pasted it this way into the actual code but we, we've still got it there so we can even delete these other ones which was my math class um, and now we're talking about the circle here so this is our class circle and, and again if I just do a C dot we can see here that what or at least what can we see which is the exposed methods are the area the engineering area and the radius they're, they're the things that are the methods and attributes are exposed to us and now we've got some hidden methods we've hidden pi we've said oh, you don't even know need to know what pi is 
for the purpose of calculating the area. So no need to put in pi, no need to know what the number is. Um, and we've even hidden pi engineering. So no need to know the, need to know the difference between the two. Um, all you need to know is if you want um, the regular area, you can use the um, area function. And if you want to use um, what we're calling this engineering area, then you're going to use this function. And you don't need to know the value of pi's that got into them. Um, we could kind of like put comments into these, which would make it more applicable, which is sort of like um, um, a good approximating area, which is slightly smaller. through area right could be something like that so uh, now when we kind of like when we if we do um, let's just do that again which is c dot sorry dot just to expose the method we've got the engineering area and I'm just wondering if it does um, it doesn't on that but if we do hover over it then we've kind of like got a little description of it and it will be like slightly less whereas this area is kind of like um, the true area right so we've got these two different things and and that's basically it we can now run this and we can see here and i can actually put like a comment in here maybe to make it a little bit clearer but this is the true area like that and this the next one down below will be the the approximated area which is slightly smaller because 3.3 .3 is less than 3.1 for 1.9 um, but that's basically and, and notice also like when we've defined our circle we've already put in our radius so like we literally don't care any like in theory we don't care anymore because we don't want to feed in we don't want to like we are just taking um, the area um, as is defined already um, when we created our class in the first place. So now we're just like looking at the function. We just want to know the area and I want to know the approximated area. I don't really care anymore about the radius because that was already fed in somewhere else earlier in the code. Like many, many thousands of lines uh, earlier in the code, it, it was created. And um, now I just want to sort of like get the area out in another piece of uh, somewhere else in my code. So I do it like this. And when we run this piece of code, we get the um, the true area is 3.14159. And we get this approximated area. But I'm just wondering why the approximated area isn't completely correct. And it's because I've done that one and I need to square it, I imagine. So um, that was probably blatantly obvious, and that means that um, the little piece of code that I've written in um, over here in the example code, um, I just need to um, put these squared bits on here actually as well. So I don't know if I'm inclined to change it right now. Maybe I'll have a go at changing it right now. I will do the update for it. So <clears throat> um, just to get it correct. In fact, let's just make sure that it works. So we just run it over here run and there we go we've got our approximated area which is 300 so um, just let's make sure that this is correct over here so I'll go to this abstraction and we have to put in a um, we need to square this squared there we go and I should be copying the right formats I guess because I've copied and pasted it all there let's just get it right paste that there and publish there we go so it will be correct again and publish fantastic all working very nicely and we will view our published site again great so back where we were we've now uh, we've covered encapsulation we've uh, in, uh, covered abstraction and I've actually mentioned that these two are what I'm going to call I've created this phrase now um, I don't know if it, someone else has created it elsewhere but I'm definitely creating this phrase I'm calling it class to code um, and if you think of or if you know about the Bible, for example, um, there's 10 commandments and, um, you know, we know what these 10 commandments are, like don't kill, don't steal and so forth. But then is uh, so we've got those sorts of commandments and, and then there's other ones like don't um, idolize other um, don't idolize other gods or something like that. Um, 
And the first five commandments are commandments between man and man, and the second five commandments are between uh, man and God. You know, that's kind of like how it's split. Well, here, these four pillars, um, I'm splitting them into things that are um, between the code and a class. And then the other two pillars are between a between how classes interact with classes. So this is like man and man here, and this one is man and God. Um, this is how our classes interact with our code, the first two, which is encapsulation, encapsulation and abstraction. And um, the next two are really class to class, which is how our um, classes um, react with other classes. But in reality, I'm actually going to say, and we will discover that polymorphism is kind of like a hybrid of those, which is um, because it's actually it's actually how the class interacts with the code as well and funnily enough even in the ten commandments i think there's one of them which is you should honor thy father and thy mother and we uh, you know if if we ask that question like is it a man to man one or is it a man to god one surely it, that's a man to man one but it's deemed to be a man to god one because it's more spiritual than just honoring your father and your mother so uh, this polymorphism one is kind of like the hybrid version of the two um, there we go a bit of religion uh, stuck into python um, let's move on. We go to inheritance, which is our first class to class thing. So, like, why can't like, well, why am I even saying that it's a class to class thing? Let's have a little read. Uh, in Python, inher inheritance is a mechanism that allows a class to inherit the attributes and methods of another class. So that should be clear enough. Um, it's inheriting from another class. It's class to class, um, allowing you to create a new class that is based on an existing one. Right. What's the point of this anyway? Well, um, it's because you can um, duplicate or save some of the code if you've built it before in a class somewhere else previously previously existed. If, if you could inherit some of these features, fantastic. You've just saved yourself some code. So inheritance is a fundamental principle of object oriented programming and is often used to create a hierarchical structure of classes. Um, which a subclass can inherit the characteristic from a superclass. Again, there's all these different words, really. But ultimately, if I draw kind of like this little picture over here, this is kind of like the parent. You know, it's got different ways of like the parent. If I, I'm literally writing this with my right hand on the mouse. Uh, there we go. And here underneath is kind of like the child. over here and the child kind of like inherits from the uh, parent like that so this could also be called the super class um, and this one is the subclass there's all different words for it but everything here is where um, this one is like whatever it is oops let's just uh, hit uh, I've got to undo that uh, this is senior okay this is probably finance terms, actually, because I'm actually going to put this one in subordinated in a way. Subordinated. Um, it's not a sub, it's subord. Right. Um, one always is inheriting from the other one. And, you know, you can refer to them as parent, child, senior, subordinated, uh, superclass, subclass, whatever you want to do. One's inheriting from the other. That's what all of those uh, phrases mean that you see. Oops, delete. Um, in the different versions of, of text that you'll read. But anyway, it's best done with an example. So let's just take this example out of here and put it straight into our um, code over here. And again, I'm going to create a new little segment in the interactive Python and paste in the code. Um, I might delete some of the white spaces again just for the purpose of clarity because there's too many white spaces in here. Um, it's nice to have white space, but I don't think some of it is necessary in our particular case. Um, just because our block of code then becomes a bit too um, sparse, should we say. There we go. So what we have is um, our first class over here. I'll kind of like highlight each part of it, but we've got our first class over here, which is animal. Right, which, uh, let's do an undo on that one because really um, the class is. Oh no, that was one. Yeah, we got our first class here, which is animal, and kind of like 
highlighted there, that's kind of like the two methods inside of the class. This is our animal class. And then we've got our next class here. Now we've only got one method inside it. Um, and then we've got our next class here, actually. And um, one of the things, actually, is this is actually going to show polymorphism as well, to be fair, because I've just noticed that there's a speaking both of them. Um, but one of the things that we can do with, with, with all of this is, um, so we've created this class animal, and we kind of want to inherit, um, like, little pieces of it. So uh, what, what do we inherit here? So we've got our class animal and we can see how we do this inheritance um, because when I double clicked on animal, you can see animals called in here and animals called in here. Um, so, but the one thing that we are inheriting um, is the name. So every time, because we always have a pet and our pet always has a name in theory. So that's kind of like, well, in that case, um, if our pet is always an animal, the animal always has a name. So we can we, we don't need to sort of like put name in here, like self.name, sort of like init self.name here and initialize self.name here. So which we could do, uh, we could literally do this, um, def um, double underscore init um, like that. And then we've got self.name here, fantastic. Um, this one's calling a super actually. I think it knows to call a super because it's got a, uh, it's got class ready here. but. Uh, imagine that this wasn't here, it wouldn't call a super, and we could, uh, we'd create the name. Um, the super's referring to um, the parent one here. Um, and it's kind of, like, it's quite nice because it's hinting that we should, so like, oh, it already recognizes that we've got a parent one here. Um, but if we didn't, well, and in fact, I'll create another one. So uh, we've got a dog, a cat, and we can, we can make a class. Okay, and this time we will do a class, but we will call it a, a fish like this um, and we won't inherit from the animal class so now we have to do this in itself and, and then we've got to do the name so we'd have to do this for each one of our different animal types um, if that was the case and then we got self dot uh, name equals a uh, name and so that would all be fine and then we would need to create our um, deaf speak one, which I will nick from here and kind of like put into here. But fish can't speak, so it will sort of like say bubble, bubble, bubble. Uh, now, these two have inherited, right? These are the inheritance. So this one's inherited because we can see it. The reason we know that it's inherited is this thing here. That's our massive clue for inheritance. That's your inheriting Python. It inherits from animal. Here's another one that's inherited. And this one hasn't inherited anything. It's standalone, which meant that I had to do this self.name again over here. But I've already got this self.name up here. So I've kind of like now done it. I've made a duplication effectively by not inheriting, which is fine. Don't inherit. But then you have to um, create a, um, another self.name. So that's just one example of inheritance, at least. Um, and I guess also um, this def.speak, um, if there was nothing in here and if we had inherited a speak, um, so if I had inherited and I didn't make a speak function that um, a speak for let something would be in here like a speak function being here and it actually raise a, a not implemented error so it, it's like extra functionality that, that you can get effectively this inheritance just gives you more features um, that's really what it does um, saves you a saves you doing some code in some cases now you don't always want to inherit you can't force yourself to inherit in like, like different various places um, but you might want to for our case so here we've created our dog we, um, we do dog and it requires a name. The name I'll actually put here is actually a game, which is a string. So now when we go over our dog, it's telling us it's a string. And when we go over our cat, it also tells us it's a string. Great, we never had to put in like string, string everywhere here. Um, in this one, we'd have to put in string again if we wanted to, to, you know, it to be a string struct. There we go, for our type hinting. So we didn't have to do that. It's all done in one. Like these two are done in one because they um, had the inheritance already. So we created the dog, we created the cat. They both had to give the name. If you didn't give the name, it'd throw an error. Um, 
and then here we can do dog dot speak and cat dot speak and we get a we should get a woof and a meow we haven't done our fish thing but we could now do a as well um print um oh we need to we need to define our fish let's get just get this one running we get our uh woof and we get our meow from the dog and from the cat and now we can do the fish so we do something like um fish i'll copy the same syntax equals fish big fish um, and then here it's asking us exactly in the same way for the name of the fish and we will call our fish bubbles there we go and now we can um do oops didn't mean to do that didn't know why i did that and then we do uh, fish dot and then speak again and speak will be where and again we can see also like going back to all of the other stuff um but here that like, all of these double underscores they're private we kind of like tend to ignore them they're, they're like um, well well here they're what's called the double underscore methods of the magic methods of the private methods um we only really care about speaker name in our particular case and we want to make it speak so we'll make the fish speak and it should just i guess it um yeah it should just return bubble bubble so fish dot speak we need to print that out so print fish dot speak so it will look like that and when we run our little piece of code now we get bubble bubble there we go so this is inher inheriting inherit from animal right and i'm only like commenting this code just so that it's clear this is inheriting from animal and this is just a new we'll call it a new new standalone class right which exhibited the um all of the properties of the first two properties that we were talking about which was um, encapsulation and abstraction um, this fish is now encapsulated and in and abstracted away from um, the animal from the cat and the dog it's a separate class on its own whereas this cat and dog class inherited um, from the animal so there we go quite a nice little um, definition of that one so we're going to move on to our fourth um, let's move this one down as well or right? um, well, let's just pull this back up here and I've got more things to do afterwards, so it's quite interesting. But let's look at the last one of these. Well, our, the pillar number four out of four, which is polymorphism. What is this polymorphism thing? And I'm just going to go here before I go into the big thing. Methods with the same name, but in different classes. Now, we have actually already seen this in a way, because in doing this... Um, cat and fish example if you note uh i use speak and then i was lazy and you speak again um so but there were two different speaks dog dot speak and cat dot speak notice that they were different so i'm already kind of like using polymorphism you can see why these things kind of like blend into each other um the inheritance even accidentally um blended into the encapsulation the encapsulation blended into the uh, inheritance i don't know which round round way around you can see and this um oh sorry not uh, the first two methods which were um the encapsulation and the abstraction they blended into each other um i don't know which way around you would say the the um, blending was but they, they're certainly blending into each other and here the inheritance and polymorphism to an extent are blending into each other as well so let's just go uh, let's just go to the code now not the code sorry the actual um, text so so we've done our inheritance and we're going to jump over to polymorphism so let's can we collapse this one yeah we can polymorphism in python in python polymorphism is a programming technique that allows a single interface to be used with multiple implementations polymorphism again this is all like big words um polymorphism is a fundamental um, principle of object-oriented programming so it's not just related to python it's related to every language also basically all the modern languages that have have um, object-oriented um, programming as part of the, their facility and it is often used to allow objects of different classes to be used interchangeably there are several ways to achieve polymorphism in python including inheritance um, again the blending uh, method overloading and method overriding um yeah this method overloading we'll be careful about that um but let's just read on um inheritance is a mechanism 
is a mechanism that allows a class to inherit the attributes and methods of other classes. So we've kind of like already seen this, allowing you to create a new class based on an existing one. This can be used to create a hierarchy of classes. I'm not even sure why I have this here because it's explained above. So really I should kind of like delete this because we already know that. Uh, method overloading, do we need to describe what method overloading is? It's a technique that allows a class to have multiple methods with the same name. So, okay, um, that's something that we kind of like need to think about in a way. Um, I'm not massively comfortable with it, but uh, you can do that type of thing, I guess. Um, and I wonder on, on this one, actually, um, it's kind of like, or is it the same thing there? Because you've got animal and you've got make sound. Um, in a way, it is, is the same example because you've got a deaf make sound. So um, I can't like have um, done it to an extent already here. Um, I, I guess I've done it in a uh, cuter way potentially. But I'm going to copy this code out because one thing that I don't like is I saw that this is white and I'm going to show you, um, or at least describe why this shouldn't be white, which is... Um, so I'll take that and let's go back to our code over here and we'll do a percent percent to create a new piece of code here and we still got our animal um, I've had to set it's good that I've segregated now into the different cells because we're running a game but basically over here we've got um, animals equals right for animal in animals but animal is a um, class here, animal dot make sound animals is basically I, I, if I want to get this right I need to type hint it uh, which is a list of I wonder if this is the right way to type in animal um, and then this is quite beautiful um, not beautiful this is different this is actually type hinting so right um what's the difference between the two and it's kind of like a little spot that i saw if i didn't have this so i'm just going to i'll put with type hinting here this is something completely different i'm i'm, I'm abstracting now i'm moving to the side right this is without type hinting right so if I didn't type in here, we don't know what animals is at this point in time. And if I do animal and then dot, um, I need to still do the for animal in animals thing. Okay, so if I did a for animal animal in animals, so if, if I did a for animal in animals and then I did an animal dot. Ah, it does actually pull it up here. I wonder if I needed to remove all of this first, then maybe let's have a look. And then do animal dot. Yeah, there we go. Um, it's interestingly enough, the type hinting from down below, because I thought type hinting would be sequential just like how Python is, but it looks like type hinting isn't. Um, but we can see here now when I do animal dot, it doesn't expose all of the methods and things, and that's because it doesn't know what type animal is actually. It's just um, see and it just sees animal as um, an item inside of list, and it doesn't know that these are of type um, animals in, in particular. So it doesn't know that it's a list of um, animals. So if I kind of like had to type hint in order to get the method exposed. Um, now, it doesn't mean that the code will work. The code does work because we can do make um, underscore sound. And this is actually something about, uh, this is something uh, nuanced to Python because uh, this will work, but I like I don't like to see it being in white here in my linter, um, although I know that it exists and so forth. Um, I like it to be exposed when I press the dot. And a way of making it being exposed when you press the dot is to, is, it will only expose things that it, it kind of like knows what they are effectively so I as the user know that um, animal is of type class animal but the um, code doesn't so I have to tell it so this make sound thing should run um, and it does we get the uh, bark and the meow and that's our without type hinting let's comment all of this one out but with type hinting 
forward slash if you notice when I did this um, we got all of the same stuff um, but it knows here already when I hover over it I think it says variable animal uh, of like it already knows that it's of type animal so when I do um, dot um, it because it knows the insides of the list I've told it or we've told it here in the type hint what the insides of the list are um, which is this class animal so it now knows to do the make sound thing which is much nicer to have kind of um, and that's kind of like what type where or how you might use type hinting in python it's a great example so i've thrown in something extra inside of um the four pillars of object oriented programming i've also thrown in a bit of type hinting for you um, but basically um what's actually happened here um and, and it's kind of like an extension of the above one but basically we've got this same method this make sound method but this method is actually um doing different things for different animals and like okay it's not that the kind of like the best um version of you know how you might use a method because we've only got like what the one print statement in there but uh, again if you had something like you know i don't know you were at doing like at number of legs plus number of ears or something like that and um, for each of these animals and it was like a summation or something um, and they might give you a, and you had like um, for example you had a dog a cat um, which had the same number of legs same number of ears um, so you know you added them up and gave the summation back um, but maybe if you threw a monkey in there it only had two legs because the other two things are called arms for a monkey um, it would have a different sum and you know so something like that might be um, the way that you could use it there so uh, I think basically as a summary of all of it we've arrived at the uh, well, we've completed the four pillars of um, the four pillars uh, or the four main principles of um, object oriented programming so we've covered those we've covered those in our language which is python it, they're applicable um, in many uh, extents by different um, guises in other languages and um, that's pretty much it if you've got comments if you've got things um, that could be done better for example in a polymorphism here if somebody wants to um, um, add their comments on um, overloading for example which i, I didn't cover um, or, um, or, or or you've got other views or, or a better way of um, showing uh, displaying polymorphism like a better link to that or something um, by all means add it on um, definitely hit the like button hit the follow button and all of the other things um, and this is my at least my first iteration and my first version of um, the um, four main pillars of um, object oriented programming and if and if you could think of a fifth pillar or a sixth pillar um, by all means add them on too and um, that will be the end of this little video.